right. So you're talking about um, this freelancer you met. Um, tell me a little bit about him, when you met him, and how do you met uh, met him, and all that stuff. And fill us in on on that. So a lot of guys used to hang out in the back of Jim Hanley's universe. My partner Lou Gonzalez at the time was gathering up artists so that we can uh, start a company together. Uh, Mike Klein was one of those artists. Mm -hmm. He had, um, you know, when I first met him, there was like some kind of like, like weird spark or aura, whatever you want to call it around him. And I asked right. him, do you work for, will you work for Marvel Comics? He was like, no, I don't. And I shook his hand. I was like, well, you will. I can sense that you will work for them very soon. I mean, we both laughed about it. Right. And literally, like two weeks later, one of the guys that we were in the group with, we would meet at Starbucks after Jim Hanley's, and then we'd have meetings at Starbucks. And there was a lot of guys that are actually writing comic books now in that group. Um, like uh, one of the guys, one of the guys who's a big shot now is uh, Vito Descalante. He was one of the writers that we used to meet up with us and chit chat. So anyway, so like Mike was basically like there's this other guy that he was talking to that was in the group and didn't last, I uh, forget his name. Mm -hmm. And then he introduced him to some editors at Marvel. And then his brother was also best friends with the editor at Marvel. And then that's, that's how he got it. Right. Literally right. like two weeks after we spoke, it was like this weird, it was a weird time, magical time in comics that that happened after I spoke to him. Right. Um, not that I'm taking credit for his employment, but just it was like one of those weird things. So you can feel it was in the air, as they say. It was in the air. It was in the air. Uh, and uh, so he started ghosting, working for Marvel, doing like submissions and stuff. Uh, and what do you mean by ghosting? Because uh, it might be well, people in, in the audience who don't know Basically, they call them finishers now, but you know, basically they would give him like unfinished work and he'd work on backgrounds or he would design characters and create characters right. uh, for them. So he started redesigning and reconceptualizing Angel, which was the first character he started working on. Right. Then he got connections with um, DC and then uh, he started doing doing uh designs for supergirl for this guy the guy who we used to work for image uh what's his name um, rob liefeld no not liefeld he was he was doing uh um, design the fan the guy who did fathom uh michael turner michael turner so michael klein was working for michael turner and doing some designs for him and some of the like when supergirl was turning evil with superman versus batman I saw a lot of that stuff being drawn. Uh, he designed the first mm -hmm. Supergirl in black with a white emblem. Mm -hmm. And then like it showed up on a cover and I just went to him. I was like, are you working for DC now? He was like, yeah, I'm doing some stuff for DC. I mean, he didn't really advertise what he was doing. He was very covert and quiet about it, but I recognize his art style. So right. I would see his artwork. Uh, right. uh, you know, so... Yeah, he now, just did – that's just something he was doing. One thing you did mention to me is that he got paid $15,000 a pop for a new character. That's correct. Yeah, so he would design a lot of stuff. So he was basically coming to meetings, listening to ideas, and then you'd start seeing them pop up in the books. So what did you guys do when you uh, started to see the stuff popping up in the books? So we set them up. We, huh. <laughs> we said, let's think of the most ridiculous thing because we would talked about – he would always say, oh, you know, like uh, – because he never read a lot of Marvel comic books in the past. So right. he would always throw ideas out there. Um, when he was working for Marvel around the time of Civil War, but like we talked about Spider-Woman, we talked about a lot of different characters. And then we started seeing Spider-Woman showing up in the books after 20 something years, you know, because right. Jessica Drew died in the comics, like when we were kids. And then all of a sudden she's back in the book. We're like, whoa, they revamped this. You know? right. and, we go, oh, and then we're like, this can't be a coincidence. you know. And then we started seeing all this stuff. And then you know, I was having designs for Red Hulk, and that came later on. Right. Uh, but then we were like, when I saw House of M and Hulk had like was bald with like tattoos, I was like, dude, this is like right on the drawings I'm doing for my Red Hulk story that I was trying to work with him, like butter him up to present it and he was like well 
if we present it, then you're not going to get credit for it. I said, no, 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 no. I said, we got to get credit for this. I don't want to do this as a ghost thing. I said, right. can't you talk to your editors and see if we can try to crack this nut with a Hulk and try to like make this happen because I have a great story. But I, didn't, I don't trust anybody 100%, so I never showed them the story. I just showed them the drawings. Right. You know? So, you so took he had the drawings no idea what this Hulk story was of the Red Hulk. So you, you know? took the drawings and ran with it. Basically, I'm sure he just drew his own stuff, presented it. They He got paid for it. I saw photographs of him in the Hulk offices and meetings, you know. Right. Like year, years later, he showed me on his cell phone, and I was like really annoyed about it, you know. Yeah, because he's almost bragging to you. Yeah, he's bragging. Like, look, we did this whole thing. And then this is the – he was the kind of guy that would say, oh, look, I had this great idea when it's your idea wow. after you said it. <laughs> so he's kind of bragging to you to your face that I stole it from you. Right. So but in other words, in, he his cut mind, you out. in his psychosis, he created this idea. It wasn't your idea. He had like that Bob Kane mentality, you know? Right. You know, or that Stan Lee mentality, like, oh, this is mine. Right, right. And that's, you know? a, that's a whole other different, you know, uh, yeah. there's a whole other th thing, too, that a lot of people don't know that Bill Finger, Jack Kirby, right. and I know right. that there's, uh, there's resistance, particularly right now, about the whole Stan Lee thing because he just recently <laughs> passed away. And I know right. there should be a lot of pushback on that. Uh, right. But I think as time goes on and when people sober up and the right. machine sort of washes off, we'll be well, able to Well, it took like 30 years before people started, like, you know, Bob Kane was dead for like 15 years before people started talking about Bill Finger again. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Because it was like... him who kind of, who came up with the whole bat thing. Right. Right. And there's a, there's a, actually a wonderful book on that. I'll put a link to a lot of the pictures and images and even the book. Yeah. Uh, the, the book is called uh, The Tomorrow Man, I believe it's called. And it's all about right. the scamming of, uh, that goes on in the uh, comic book industry, including that the mm -hmm. reason that Jack didn't have the rights was because the contracts were placed on the back of the checks. Uh, right. And exactly. You had to sign it in order to get your money. So right. they signed away. Yeah, it's very slick stuff that they used to do. Uh, yeah, I mean that's the that's the that's the the, the attitude of the industry. Um, right. You know, lots of stuff. So then we set them up with Spider Ham, and then we saw Civil War Spider Ham show up, and we're like, "Oh, that's it. Just got done. We're not dealing with him anymore. Right. He's not invited to any more meetings. You know. Right. Right. Uh, you know. And you know, and he was very suspect because he would never like. Show us what he's working on. You know, we were like, we were developing books and stories. We had an anthology come out called the No One Anthology. Right. And then when we went to print, he was like, oh, no, don't print my story. Don't print it, you know. And he was always very weird, like not taking pictures. Like, he didn't want to be in pictures with us. Like, he turned his head. Or, and we got a few together, but it was just like, he was just very weird like that. He didn't want to go to conventions with us anymore. We used to go so do you to think conventions it was, as a group. Do you think that it was probably because... Uh, he knew that if he was seen, that later on, if you guys would be able to say, oh, we knew that guy and he took our ideas. Right. 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 <laughs> exactly. Wow. wow. I'm laughing about it in retrospect because we were all young then. You know? It kind of gets personal as you get older and you're like, you know. So when the Red Hulk came out, that was it. I mean, that was in 2007. And I was developing it in 2004. And I kind of let the idea die down because it was just like, well, I'm not going to work for Marvel. We're not talking to this guy anymore, whatever. Right. I never thought in a million years that he would take that over to them, you know, because that was like something that I was playing with. It was almost like my little hobby. I'm going to draw this cartoony looking Red Hulk, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, that was kind of like my little fantasy about working for Marvel. Like, and I was building up this thing literally building up this whole universe about him a story i wrote a script about it tied it into the marvel universe and then right. when it happened i was just like so and you could tell that they didn't know because the whole two almost two years they didn't have an origin story of who the red hulk is they made it a mystery they didn't know you know they had like betsy ross come back to life i mean these characters were dead that they to make like thunderbolt ross red hulk you no know, sense that he was yeah. dead yeah. And they made a Red She Hulk, which was Betsy Russell, who was dead. You know? um, it made no sense. Uh, Red Hulk was designed to be Bruce Banner. You know? Right. It was, uh, you mentioned it to me. It was different levels, kind of like Goku. Right. right. It was exactly like Goku. Like I figured, you know, you had the Grey Hulk, you had the Red Hulk, 
there was an annual many years ago where Hulk was blue for one issue because he went underwater uh, to fight Namor, um, which is silly. But it's like, and I was like, well, Hulk is like different levels. And uh, Dale Keown was like the inspiration for that because I think Dale Keown was the one that really got into the psychosis of the Hulk. Right. You know? Right. He was. He and I was like, well, the, yeah. I mean, he's. I mean, nothing against Kirby. I mean, Kirby established it. But Kirby's was more like a Jekyll and Hyde Frankenstein uh, combination, you know? Yeah. Uh, what him and Lee did was basically that. It was like a rehashing of. But when Del Keown came on, um, I mean, John Byrne too. John Byrne had Hulk, you know, switching personas where mm-hmm. Hulk became like sane. And then he had the whole Hulk Buster thing. And, so I grew up right. reading all that stuff as a kid. And I was like, well, Red Hulk has to be like the next level, you know? Right. Like what would happen if the Red Hulk is like super intelligent, like we're talking about like, 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 like a, Einstein. The, the guy who's, the, like an Einstein, or I was thinking like the more modern guy, the guy in the wheelchair, what's his oh, name? Oh, Stephen uh, Hawking. Like a, like a Stephen Hawking. It's like, what if, like the Red Hulk is not a savage, raging Hulk, but he's like Stephen Hawking, like completely enlightened. But then when he turns back into Bruce Banner, he's like a raging, mad, crazy person. <laughs> right, right. You know that. You know, so not to give him any ideas, but basically Bruce Banner would end up in a mental institution, and you'd have the incredible Bruce Banner. Well, for like one year. I'll you tell know? you one thing: if they're listening to this interview, you know that's going yeah. in, right? It's gonna happen, yeah. But I started to see things of like little things like there was an issue with Nightmare because I used to get the subscriptions and Nightmare had there was a scene of him in a, in a straight jacket and I was like, what the? F-? <laughs> right, right. So it was like Bruce Banner. Imagine like one flew over the cuckoo's nest with Bruce Banner instead of Jack Nicholson, you know? Right. But right. then he's the raging Hulk. You know? So my question. So he's more like the Indian more than the Jack Nicholson. He's more like the big Indian, you know? So, right. And, and, yeah. So my question for you is then, I had several different questions, but my first question is, because you've told me right. about your youth and what happened to you with that teacher who was an editor, and then you had right. this Mike guy who, you know, <laughs> pretty blatantly uh, took your ideas. Uh, right. I mean, being a fan, because that's what excites you about these characters, I mean, how did that affect you on the fan side of, of that, looking at these companies? Uh, and being treated this way, were, were you expecting oh, it? Irritated me. I, I slowly started not to read them anymore because of that. I, I just started to try to pull away from it. Like I just felt like I couldn't trust anybody. But and even creative wise, there were so many writers in, in that in that meeting room that we that you know I was a, I started downsizing. Like I don't want seventeen people in our group. I want to be able to deal with people one on one. Like we even used to meet in the shopping mall at. Um, we used to in the shopping mall and draw, like just draw jam, like a, what was it called, AMS, or actually it was called Manhattan Mall at the time, on 34th Street. And a lot of people that used to come through and draw and jam with us, like Kenny Dillard. I mean, there's like a lot of, like, and then like Afua Richardson, she was one of the people that used to come through, and Chuck Collins. We were all just people just meeting each other and drawing. It was kind of like a real, but the artist was cooler with the writers. You couldn't really trust them because they're not really talented, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, so rough. Right? Rough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Rough. Like, I was less threatened by the artists and more threatened by the like, writers. You know? But it's like, but we were, you know, we had a lot of cool times, you know? And then we, from Starbucks to the Manhattan Mall, and we did meetings. Then we had meetings at my house, and we met Chris Duckett, and we had meetings at his house. And then eventually, Bronx Heroes got formulated and put together. Mm-hmm. And then people fell off. Like, whoever didn't, like, you know, we put deadlines, and we were like, let's try to get a book. And most people didn't fall through. Then we met. These guys from Creator One Comics, the Gary and Ed, and we worked with them for a little bit. Right. So we just kind of met, we uh, just like really like squeezed it down and said, let's try to focus on those who are going to produce for a book. Right. So it was fun to just meet up and draw and hang out and talk about ideas. But once we were already getting ripped off by this guy, we were just like, let's break away from this, you know. So my question and is, not be so public. My next know? question is like, this: Like, I'll tell something really ridiculous what? when he was working for DC before this Hulk thing happened. Uh, I was working on a story called The Superhero Killers, and we were at a comic convention, me and Chris, and we we're sitting next to 
uh, you know, I was selling pornographic superhero comics at the time. Okay. Called OD's Helpful Hints. Right. You know? And then we had A World Without Superheroes, a comic. So I was selling those two books. And and I'm sitting next to these this guy, again, at Big Apple, right? Um, and there's a lot of people there, like, like, like uh, these English guys and stuff. And um, mm-hmm. the, the guy, the guy that was, uh, I'm looking up his name here right now because I don't remember his name, but I was sitting next to him and we were just showing, all right, so we were just showing, uh, sharing stuff with these guys that work for the industry because it's a comic convention. You were there with a weekend. Right. And this guy, Derek Robinson, like, you know, was like looking at my stuff. He's like, this is crazy. This is psychotic. And I was like, this is the future. It's going to be like porn and superheroes and shit like that. And then now Derek Robinson has a show on Amazon called The Boys, you know. Mm. <laughs> you know we had a and we had a, a, a Ashcan book that we were trying to push forward that really didn't go anywhere. It was called the Superhero Killers, and it was about these lawyers that basically release villains from prison and then hire them to kill superheroes. And then Derek Robinson's looking at this Ashcan. We gave him copies of you know. It's a like blatant, and then and then the boys come out later on, and then we're like, yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, it's like you know, it's just like and at that convention, we also had the guy who used to draw Hellblazer and preacher covers. He did a sketch for me that day. We were just everyone was learning. after doing conventions that you can't always share your ideas with people just because they're creators. You know, right? You, you can't be that open. You know, no. So. I mean, the boys has a lot of similarities to a world without superheroes. It's not exactly a that I like, but it's almost like they took the porno comic of the superhero book that I was doing, the parody, and then took the superhero killers, and then took the world without superheroes, and just kind of like merge all three together. Right. You know, uh, uh, you know, it's just like it sounds ridiculous, but true story. I know like ten people in my group that were there. We were there. We saw it happen. And when the boys came out, we're like, "What the is this?" Uh, you know. You know, we were putting out titles. Another one with the guy Mike, like he was asking about Green Lantern at one of the when he started working for DC. And then at this point, I was really pissed off about everything that he already did. And I was right. like, he was like, well, "What would you do to change Green Lantern?" I was like, what? "I said, I said, you know, I just gave him a dirty look." I said, "Well, you know, you, you could uh, Green Lantern is limited and he's boring because he's just green and yellow." I said, "It should be like the Power Rangers, where there's a different color." Room and and then you know it's like and then and then Hal Jordan gets all the kids acquire each color of each ring to, to get a new power a new ability and then at the end he becomes gay and I said that as a joke and I was like you know and I walked away from him <laughs> but then what happens you have this thing called Darkest Night with the zombie you know and in, in our superhero killers comic we had a character called the Dark Lantern which is basically like Green Lantern but black you know, like a black power. Right. So then we had this zombie black as night that came out. And I was like, look at this. I can't say anything to this guy, not even insulting him. I can't even insult him because now we have this thing with all these different color power rings. <laughs> wow. And then, and then the new 52 comes out with that book. When I got sued by the new, by, by DC comics and Marvel, when the new 52 book came out, uh, they actually made uh, the the Golden Age Green Lantern and made him younger. Right. And he was gay. <laughs> wow. So I was like, I can't even tell this guy off, like to go f- himself, you know. Wow. But it shows you you were feeding him through all this stuff. Now, one thing I was going to say to you, you met this guy by accident, right? Yeah, it was accident. But I imagine that there are more than just one mic. Kicking around, oh, there's tons. Uh, the industry and conventions in particular, who you never know who's sitting next to you. Usually, right? You, you exactly, know, you don't. And who's buying your stuff and who's taking photos of your your banners? And, tons of people and everything else. Um, right. And that's something that I think that most uh, creators need to know about. That ultimately, you just can't put that much trust. Unfortunately. It's and you'd be very careful what you say because even something in a joke or in an insult, you know, that it, 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 you're feeding people who have no ideas, ideas. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to say, hey, I wrote that from Jeff Johns or whatever or whatever. What they wrote is what they wrote. But I was just telling this guy off to go because of the whole Red Hulk thing. Right. 
Right. And he has a nerve to come back and ask me about Green Lantern. Like, go yourself, you know? It's so like... he, he literally <laughs> takes, he takes your whole joke and turns it into something. So it's like, literally, you're being harvested. Literally, literally. And it's, it, and these people are very, there's a lot of them. And I, now I can tell when someone's doing that. Like, they're like, hey, man, can you get me published? Can you work with me? You know, I got these well, ideas. And